but some of you are stubborn. You want to go your own way. You don't want God changing your plans and telling you what to do with your life. You're too proud to humble yourself. You're afraid of what your friends will think if you leave your past and you start living for God. You refuse to live like God wants you to live. And like a stubborn ox, you are kicking against the goats. It's alive and set up and began to speak. Now, I'm not telling you that when God is doing something that you won't get a feeling. And I'm not telling you that you won't be emotional, and I'm not telling you that your hands won't sweat and you won't have a cold chill run down your spine, but I am telling you that you don't need any of those things to prove that God is doing something because Jesus has already proven himself and God has already spoken. Your job and my job is to respond to God's word, period. Whether you have an emotion or a feeling or see a sign in the sky or not, you are obligated to respond to God's word if you want to see God in action. For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. That's not even the sermon, that's just the introduction. Philippians 2.12, in the original Koine Greek of the New Testament, says this. Metaphobu kaitromu tain hauton sotrarian karagaste. With fear and trembling, work out your own salvation. I want you to notice the order of the words. The Koine Greek does not read like English. The English were pretty simple, we're left to right. Koine Greek doesn't do that. It works in phrases and it works in, in subject matter. Ma many people today are working out their own salvation. They have their own idea of what a Christian is and how a Christian lives and what a Christian believes. They have worked out their own salvation, but they have left out the fear and trembling because they're not responding to what God has already spoken. Have you ever spoken to somebody about becoming a Christian and they say to you, just leave me alone. Leave me alone because I have it all worked out. I don't need your help. I don't want your advice. I'm not interested in your opinion. I don't want to hear your testimony because I have my Christianity all worked out. This verse in Philippians is potentially awkward theologically because it seems to promote the idea that human beings can accomplish their own salvation by their own means and then live it their own way. We see a lot of that these days. Everyone has their own opinion of what a Christian is and of what salvation is and how everything's going to work out in the end, but no scripture should ever be interpreted without observing its context. It amazes me sometimes how people will, uh, will know one or two verses of Scripture, but they have no idea of the context from which it was taken. They don't know who it was written to. They don't know when it was written or what was happening at the time that it was written, but they can easily pull a few words out of the Bible and make those words say what they want them to say. They will say, well, Jesus drank wine. <laughs> Do you know that there is no Scripture that states that Jesus drank wine? Not one verse in the Bible says anything about Jesus drinking fermented alcohol. He was accused of it. He was accused of being a wine-bibber and a drunk, but he was also accused of being a, an adulterer and a blasphemer, but he was none of those things. They lied about Jesus just like they lie about you. Somebody will say, well, Jesus didn't condemn homosexuals, or there's nothing in the Bible about, uh, that condemns abortion. They're experts on a book that they've never read and have never studied. They know only what they choose to know. They have it all figured out, and they have it all worked out. The key to interpreting this verse of Scripture is made clear by what's said in the very next verse. Verse 13 is a continuing of the thought of verse 12. And it says, for it is God who is at work in you enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I spoke about this last week. Salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. You have nothing to do with it. It's not up to you to work it out, for it is the Holy Spirit that births you into God's kingdom. Just as in your physical birth, when your mother did all of the work, so it is in your spiritual birth, when the Holy Spirit does all of the work to save you from sin and then perfect you into holiness. Now, I know people will think that they're saved because they say, well, I believe in God. Well, so do the demons in hell, and they tremble. Well, I, I pray and I talk to God. The devil talks to God every day. That does not make you saved. What you do does not make you saved. The work of the Holy Spirit is what saves you. Millions upon millions of people in America today will tell you that they're a Christian. But if you observe them, you'll eventually become confused because of the diversity of ways that each of them live their lives. 
There is many opinions as to what a Christian is as there are people because many professing believers, and I use that word very loosely, many professing believers have worked out their own salvation, but they have neglected God's word. There are some Christians who are fully surrendered to God and who are dedicated to work as servants in God's kingdom. God's first in their life, and they can prove that God's first by the way they live. Their life bears fruit that proves their salvation. Their life produces the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But there are others who seem to be split between God and the world. They split their time between spiritual things and worldly things. They're convinced that they have a good balance. They're not very sinful, but they're not very spiritual either. They take time out for God when they feel it's necessary, but they still have plenty of time left over to do everything else. They have their salvation all worked out. They've come up with a plan that covers what they believe to be necessary for them to avoid hell and gain heaven. They figured out the minimum commitment that would obligate God to meet their needs and answer their prayers, but still appease their lifestyle and get them to heaven when they die. The Holy Spirit is not at work in them. They claim Christianity, but there was no evidence to prove that they have been born again. They have worked out what works for them. The trouble is, what they have worked out does not work. It doesn't work. Some people are content with their life. Not everybody is miserable going, oh boy, I probably need to be saved. Some people are very content with their life. They're content with their financial status. They're content with their social status. They're happy with where they are. And when it comes to their relationship with God, they're religious and they're traditional. And in their mind, they believe that they have it covered. They are satisfied that their relationship with God is good enough. They're convinced that it's good enough to obligate God to answer their prayers when they need him to. It's good enough to make it to heaven when they die. They're content with their spiritual state. So when the Holy Spirit confronts them, they refuse to repent of their rebellion and change their ways. There was a man who lived during the time of the early church, and his name was Saul. You probably know him as Paul. Saul was a menace to the early Christian church. In Acts chapter 7, the Bible says that he watched over the coats of the men who stoned Stephen to death. In Acts chapter 8, we read that he began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Opening chapter 9, we're met with these words, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, meaning those followers of Christ, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul was a bad dude. He was a nasty character. Some people hated him and a lot of people feared him. But Saul believed that he was right with God. He was religious and he was zealous in his work. He had been endorsed by the prevailing powers of his day and he was self-justified in his mission. But Saul hated Jesus. And he hated Christians. And because of his hatred, he was doing everything within his power to destroy Christianity. One day, Saul was traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus to persecute more Christians. Suddenly a brilliant light blinded him and stopped him in his tracks. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. You know what a goad is? Today we call them cattle prods. Anybody still use cattle prods? Any of you cattle farmers? You, anybody? Nobody use cattle prods? I know years ago they... Peg, you use one on Dave? Okay, I didn't know. Uh, figure it out. Years ago, I was in Farm and Fleet. This is when I was very young, and, and my nephew was very, very young. And we were in Farm and Fleet, and they had a cattle prod laying on the shelf. They were, they were uh, electrical, you know. And uh, he said, what's this? And the devil's sitting here telling me what to do. I said, well... You hold this end with your hand, you put your other hand on the end, and then you hit that button. He is not right to this day. 
The term used here was a Greek proverb, but it was also familiar to the Jews and anybody that made a living in agriculture. An ox goad was a stick with a pointed piece of iron on its tip used to, pro to prod the oxen when they were plowing. The farmer would prick the animal to steer it in the right direction, but sometimes the ox would be stubborn and it would rebel and it would kick against the goad. And as it rebelled, the goad would be driven further into its flesh. In essence, the more the ox rebelled, the more it suffered. But its suffering wasn't necessary because its suffering was self-inflicted. So we have Jesus' words to Saul on the road to Damascus. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. What Jesus was telling Saul was, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. It's up to you. It's up to you. Maybe the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. You know what you need to repent of your sins. You know you need to change your ways. But you're as stubborn as an ox. God has been prodding you to surrender to him to change the direction of your life, but you have been kicking against the goad. And now you are suffering needlessly. You're enduring hardships that aren't necessary because you refuse to obey the master. God is patient. He's merciful, slow to anger, and forgiving, and he loves you with an unfathomable love. But when you're living outside of God's will, because he loves you, he will try to steer you in the right direction. He will prod you to get you to change your course for the right course. But some of you are stubborn. You want to go your own way. You don't want God changing your plans and telling you what to do with your life. You're too proud to humble yourself. You're afraid of what your friends will think if you leave your past and you start living for God. You refuse to live like God wants you to live. And like a stubborn ox, you are kicking against the goats. You're struggling and you're suffering. But the pain that you're suffering isn't from God. The issues that you're dealing with aren't God's fault. The problems that you have day in and day out, the dysfunction in your home, the stress in your marriage that is wearing at your nerves and the hole in your bank account and the struggle with your boss isn't because God's trying to hurt you, but it's because he's trying to steer you in the right direction. But you're stubborn. You want to be in control and still want to do your own thing, but you're hurting yourself because you're kicking against the goats. You don't want to admit that where you are right now is your own fault. So you're trying to fix it yourself. You're going to clean up your own mess and you're going to solve your own problems, but the harder you try to fix things, the more damage is being done because you are kicking against God. You can do it the easy way or you can do it the hard way. You can continue to resist God's prodding, but when God wants you, he's going to come after you. And when God comes after, with you, after you, he's going to stop you in your track and he's going to confront you because he wants to save you. He wants to change your direction and to change your life. God may stop you with health problems. He may make you deal with your own mortality and force you to your knees seeking his help and his healing. He might stop you with financial trouble and put you in a situation that's bigger than your bank account so you have to turn to him as your supplier. He'll stop you with conflict in your marriage and challenges with your children so you'll be forced to fall on your knees and turn to him from hell. You'll get to the place where you say, I can't handle this anymore. And that's exactly where God wants you to be. When God wants you, he will stop you and then he will confront you and demand an answer for why you keep living the way that you're living. What was wrong with Saul's life anyway? I mean, Saul, in our day and age, would have been hailed as a great religious figure. So why did Jesus tell him he was kicking against the goats? He was a successful man, a religious man, and a famous man. Saul was a powerful man. He was a hardworking man. The prevailing opinion of the day was that Saul was in the right place and he was doing the right thing. So what was wrong with Saul? First of all, there was a problem with Saul's faith. Saul had a religion, but he didn't have a relationship with Jesus. We know this because Saul didn't recognize the voice that called to him. He wasn't familiar enough with Jesus to know that it was Jesus who was speaking to him. And so he asked, who are you? Some of you have been in church your entire life, but you still don't know who Jesus is. You know the church, you know religion, you know tradition, you have your act down, and you wear the uniform, but you don't know Jesus, and you cannot recognize his voice. Saul was a Jew. 
He was a teacher of Judaism. Acts 23 says, brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. In Philippians 3, he described himself as circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as a zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. He had checked all of the boxes, and he had jumped through all of the hoops. But Saul's religion was an inherited religion. Listen to me here. It was a religion that he had learned from his father. Saul had grown up in a Pharisee's house. He was taught the life of a Pharisee when he was a child. And as he grew older, he sat under the teaching of Gamaliel, the most influential Jewish teacher of his day. Saul knew all of the laws and he knew all of the ordinances of Judaism, but Saul didn't know Jesus. I'm talking to some of you teenagers here. You've been in church since day one. You were brought here at, right after your birth. You were dedicated here by your parents. You've been in Sunday school. You've been in Bible school. You've been in youth, but you don't know Jesus. You've gone through the motions. You, you've went to the altar. You've said a prayer and you think that you've done enough, but you still don't know who Jesus is. That's the peril of inherited religion. Some of you attend a church because it's where your mom and dad attended. It's where grandma and grandpa attended. You believe what you believe because somebody's handed down their religion to you and you've accepted it as truth. Parents, it's important that we teach our children the tenets of Christianity. It's important that we help them understand the morals and the ethics that go with our faith, but it is far more important that we introduce our children to Jesus. If our kids grow up believing that Christianity is only means going to church on Sunday, singing a few songs, praying a few prayers, and standing for the right things, then we're failing as parents. If our children equate Christianity with being against abortion and against premarital sex and against drugs and alcohol and all of the taboos of our day, then we failed them. Our children don't need to inherit our religion. They need to meet our Savior. I'll wait. Saul had a religion, but he didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Real salvation is a personal relationship with Jesus. Acts 4.12 says salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mankind whereby we must, must, we must be saved. Real salvation is personal. It's an intimate relationship with Jesus. He's the one that God the Father sent to this earth. He's the one that suffered and died on the cross for your sins. He's the one that resurrected on the third day and now sits at the right hand of God in heaven. And he will be, one day, will be your judge. Do you know Jesus? It's Jesus who will decide where you're going to spend eternity. One day you're going to bow before him and you will acknowledge that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says there's coming a day when every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not Allah, not Buddha, not Confucius, not Mohammed, not your church, not your pastor, not your denomination, and most definitely not you, but Jesus only. There come a day when the religious and the self-righteous are going to bow before, before Jesus and convince that they're about to receive their heavenly reward, but Jesus is going to say to them, sorry, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him well enough to recognize his voice? Saul was kicking against the goats. He was fighting someone that was greater than his religion. He was fighting someone who was greater than the church organization that he served. Saul was rebelling against the only one who could save his soul. He thought he was doing God's business. He thought that he was in the right place, but he wasn't living his life in God's will. He didn't know the very God that he claimed to serve. Saul thought that in order to protect his religion, he would have to destroy Christianity. He sought permission from the high priest to continue his policy of persecution. He believed that if the high priest gave him permission, then surely what he was doing must be the will of God. I see this happen in churches all over the place. People will think they're serving God and they're destroying their church. They think they're serving God and they destroy their pastor. They think they're serving God and they give Christianity a bad reputation in their community. Convinced they're doing God's will, but they're kicking against the goats. That's why when on the road to Damascus, Jesus asked him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was shocked to the core. He believed that he was doing God's business only to discover that he was completely out of the will of God. He was about to learn that the very one that he was fighting 
The goal that he was kicking against was God himself. Some of you know how Saul felt. God has been urging you and prompting you and calling you to surrender your life to him, but you are bound and determined that you're going to save yourself. So you've taken on a form of religion. You attend a church. You bought yourself a Bible. You've cleaned up your act a little bit, but you've resisted the Holy Spirit's invitation to surrender your soul. You've resisted the opportunity to know Jesus personally. Saul had been blinded by public opinion. He was blinded by his own zeal. He was blinded by his hatred and his anger. But on the road to Damascus, all of that would change. Instead of being blinded by his own character flaws, Saul would be blinded by the light of Jesus Christ. The light of Jesus flashed before Saul, and it was so bright that he couldn't describe his experience. The best that he could say was, I saw on the way a light from heaven that was brighter than the sun shining all around me. Oh, have you seen the light? Have you seen the light? Has the Holy Spirit shown on you and exposed your sin? Has the brightness of Jesus blinded you? Praise the Lord, I saw the light. God had to do something dramatic to knock Saul off of his pedestal. God is like that sometimes. He'll knock us down so he can pick us back up and change us completely. God might knock you down so he can pick you up. We often see being knocked down as harsh and brutal and unloving, but in reality, if we could see it from God's perspective and we could see what God sees, we would understand that being knocked down is an act of love and compassion. We aren't being persecuted and we aren't being punished, but we're in the grip of God's grace. Being blinded like Saul would seem like a tragic event. I can't imagine the drastic changes that I'd have to face if I suddenly lost my sight. But being blinded drove Saul to his knees, and there he would discover a loving and caring and forgiving Savior. Being blinded knocked and knocked down by God turned Saul from kicking against the goads to a personal relationship with Jesus the Christ. When he was knocked down by God, Saul did something that revealed his broken spirit. He asked two questions. These are probably the two most important questions that any of us could ever ask God. His questions were, who are you? And what do you want me to do? The first question Saul asked was, who are you? We don't ask this enough. We assume that it's the voice of God when we hear all kinds of other voices. You know, we are are so into uh, the internet and TV and radio and people's books and all, and we are hearing all kinds of voices, but we can't distinguish whether or not those voices are God. We just assume that they are. But Saul said, who are you? This is a personal question. He realized that the one speaking to him wasn't the God that he knew. This wasn't the God that he had been serving. All of the years of training were put into perspective. And in this one brilliant moment, Saul realized that he didn't know God at all. He knew religion. He knew the rituals of his faith. He knew tradition and work and dedication, but he didn't know God. To Saul, God was some distant, aloof creator who had put the universe together, set it in motion, and then left it to run its course. Sure, God had spoken to Abraham and Moses and a few others in Israel's past, but to Saul, God was just a theory. He was a historical figure. He was a face of religion and a list of do's and don'ts. But on the road to Damascus, Saul met a God that he never dreamed existed. He met a personal God, never truly understanding that he could know his creator in such a way. He asked, who are you? His question was a personal question, but it was also a relational question. Who are you to me? He wasn't just seeking information. He didn't simply imply, uh, simply want intelligence on what the light was or who was speaking to him. But Saul wanted to know what all of this meant for his life. And Jesus answered his question by saying, I am Jesus the Nazarene whom you are persecuting. We need to understand the meaning of this answer. Saul understood Jesus' words immediately. He had been persecuting Jesus for a long time. He'd watched the coach while Stephen gave his defense and was murdered. He heard the testimony of who Jesus was time and time again as he arrested and persecuted Jesus' followers. But it was at this one divine moment that Saul came to understand that everything he had heard about Jesus was true. Oh, what a moment. Everything he had heard was true. Some of you are right there, right now. You've heard a whole lot about Jesus, but you're not convinced that it's true. 
Suddenly Saul understood what, Je what Stephen had said. He understood that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for his sins. He understood that it was all true. He did, Jesus did resurrect from the dead on the third day. He understood that without Jesus as his Savior, he wasn't going to be forgiven of his sin, and he wasn't going to inherit eternal life. He probably didn't have all of the theology down right away, but he understood that he was dead in his sins without a personal relationship with the one he'd be persecuting. At some point in your life, you have to come to the realization that the Bible is the word of the living God. And it's all true. Jesus is God's son, and everything that the Bible has said about him as, is true. At some point, you have to come to grips with the facts that this is real and it's all true. It was at that moment that Saul surrendered his life to Jesus. How do we know that? Because of the next question that he asked. He asked, Lord, what do you want me to do? I've been leading my own life and doing my own thing, but now I want to live in your will. What do you want me to do? So Jesus answered Saul again. He said, get up and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all that's been appointed for you to do. And there Saul, still blind, was led by the hand to Damascus, where his sight was restored and where he was taught the word of God. Man studied the scriptures his whole life, but now he's being taught the word of God. He began a ministry that would lead him all over the known world. He would take three missionary journeys, start an untold number of churches, lead thousands to a personal relationship with Jesus, write several books of the New Testament, and then eventually end up in Rome where he would die for the Savior that stopped him and changed him on the road to Damascus. Sometimes for God to save us, he first has to break us. That's exactly what God did to Saul. God broke him, and then he restored him. But in that process, Saul came to know Jesus personally. I am convinced that some of you stubborn oxes, oxen, some of you stubborn oxen who've been poked and prodded, who are suffering needlessly, when you are finally broken, are going to become some of the best Christians we have ever had in this church. I want to ask you today, do you know Jesus personally? Do you recognize his voice when he speaks to you? Do you know his will for your life? God might be breaking you right now. You thought all along that you knew Jesus, but you're finding out that you knew you never knew him at all. Maybe he stopped you and now he's confronting you. You've been kicking against the goads and you're in pain. But God is using your pain to break your will so you'll come to know him as your personal Lord and Savior. How long are you going to kick against the goats? How long are you going to suffer needlessly? How long are you going to resist him and his will for your life? How much pain do you need to suffer before you finally give up and surrender your whole self to him? 